I'm Cool Gray, and this is a special supplement to the Cool Gray in Studio A podcast. And I'm calling this mini-sode number four, which would indicate that there are three other mini-sodes that came before this one. But what makes this one special is that it actually is a mini version of the podcast, as opposed to completely separate content that I created as a bonus that um, either complements or uh, in other ways enhances an episode or completely stands alone. I had a conversation for season three, episode 19 with Dr. Melvin Morse, and the topic of our conversation was near-death experiences in children. It's a fascinating topic, and we talked about it for about an hour, but we also recorded about two hours in all. So an additional hour or so of conversation about a number of other subjects that were really just frankly too fascinating to leave on the cutting room floor. So in order to keep that episode to about an hour, which is what I typically try to do, I've created this special mini-sode where I've extracted the information from the conversation that was not about near-death experiences in children, but was about a number of other very interesting topics. And those are compiled here for you to listen to. So what you're going to hear uh, is the rest of the content. There'll be little cards that come up that will tell you what we're going to talk about in each of those segments. And if you've listened to the podcast already, you may know what some of those topics are. So I won't go over them again now. I'll just go ahead and get right into it. Please join me on the other side of this for my parting thought. And I appreciate you watching and listening in. Here we go. So let's start with something I saw on your website uh, when I was doing my research in preparation for this interview, uh, I'm, I'm going to read a little paragraph and then ask you to expand on it if you would. And uh, it, you said this, during a neurology rotation at Johns Hopkins, you cared for patients who had half their brains removed or something that's called split brain surgery, which I've never heard of. Uh, you were assessing the effects of this surgery uh, and the effects that it had on consciousness. And you say on your website that it was your first understanding that consciousness doesn't depend on brain function. That statement was so compelling to me. And you talk about attending lectures about something called functional neurogenesis, which is a concept that all thought and experience can change our brains and that our brains are also capable of repairing itself. There's a lot packed into that little paragraph. And I would just love for you to see if you could explain it to me like I'm five, Dr. Morse. <laughs> first of all, call me Melvin. Um, Thank you, Melvin. You know, I was always trained, and I think most people from a common sense point of view think that the brain creates consciousness. And that that's such a default point of view that it, it, it really interferes with us understanding anything else. You know, everything else uh, seems like, you know, you have to prove it. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, when I was a medical student at Johns Hopkins, I had discovered early on that this idea that the brain creates consciousness uh, is uh, skeptical. Uh, or, it you know, almost seems backward to me. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I did a rotation uh, with the great Dr. Moncastle. And what he did in patients that had severe seizures was he actually removed half of their brain. That's unbelievable well, to me on its face. I've never even yeah. heard of any. Is that something that's commonly done? Oh, no, it's extremely rare. And it would only be done because these patients had such intractable seizures that it was felt that they could no otherwise, you know, not survive. Was it a particular half of the brain each time or did it depend on their uh, the imaging studies that were done for each patient? It had to do with the nature of their seizures and such mm -hmm. as that. Mm -hmm. And they tried to remove... Um, the right side of the brain, because of course the left side of the brain is associated with the language and such as that. Uh -huh. Well, I was a medical student and it was my job to sort of, you know, do, do the assessment of, you know, these patients before and after uh, surgery. And to my, actually to my shock, I uh, worked up a 13 year old boy who had had uh, the right side of his brain, the entire half of the brain removed. Unbelievable. And I could find virtually nothing wrong with him. He still had all his memories. He still had a sense of humor. He still had the same personality that he had uh, prior to his surgery. Uh, he walked with a slight limp. That was the only evidence uh, that uh, he had had this uh, radical surgery. What year was this that that, that, that case took place? 
Let's see. Uh, I was at Hopkins. Uh, it was 1983, I guess. And Amazing that we never, I, I would think that would be in every newspaper and on every news broadcast, you know, in, uh, the, in the country. The books have been written about it. Uh -huh. And uh, the um, uh, physician who uh, pioneered split brain research received the Nobel Prize mm -hmm. uh, for that type of research. So, so like so much having to do with consciousness, et cetera, you actually have to be a scientist to understand what's going on, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because I think that the general public is just uh, unaware of this. Right. And while I was at Hopkins, um, this type of uh, research then, of course, stimulated other research. And uh, that was... Uh, uh, Hopkins was the first to pioneer something called functional neurogenesis. So right. neuro, your brain, uh, you know, the, your brain cells. Genesis meaning, you know, the creation. To create, yeah, generate, yeah. And what they discovered, these scientists who actually I worked with as a medical student again, was that almost any human experience then actually changes the structure of the brain. And so it, it's a dance between the brain and experience and the outside environment. It, it's not as if just the brain is creating everything. It's instead definitely a two-way street. And that suggests that there's some sort of template that uh, imposes itself on the brain. Uh, that it's not the brain creating consciousness, but it's rather consciousness somehow working through the brain. And if consciousness can't go through the ordinary pathways... You know, I was taught in medical school, uh, you know, the, the, you know, this side of the brain controls uh, the other side of the body, you know, et cetera. Consciousness will actually rewire the brain. I, as a complete lay person, uh, and, and I know that I, I might be trying to say something that's above my pay grade here, but I seem to remember learning in school that uh, the way that we form memories is a physical, a physiological process where there are little, uh, I think the way it was described to me is that there were like little folds in the gray matter that kind of held on to almost like little pockets that held on to each experience and each memory that we have, and that those can um, keep be sort of hidden until we need to recall them and and i always have this image in my head of like little little doors opening up in my brain it's like oh there's that memory is that anything like what's going on there or is that a completely separate issue the the uh, one of the great mysteries of today in terms of not just what is consciousness but what is memory mm -hmm. and there actually is no modern theory of how memories are stored in the brain you're referring, of course, to, you know, one of the, uh, you know, the many speculations and the many sort of, you know, models that have been created about memory, but none of them have actually panned out in the laboratory. And Fred Lashler, who was uh, the father of modern uh, memory research, he said something very interesting at the end of his career. He said, if I didn't know better, I would actually think that memories are stored outside the brain. And this, of course, fits with my patient from when I was at Hopkins, because one half of his brain was removed. Oh, and it wasn't impacting his his consciousness as far all, as you could measure. He had all his memories. Yeah. And that, that's not, uh, I have uh, worked uh, for many years with another patient. Uh, she uh, lost about 80% of her uh, brain uh, uh, secondary to a stroke. And again, she retained all her memories once she uh, came out of coma. So where are those memories stored? Remember, this universe is an informational universe. Yeah. So the information is stored in the very energetic field, which makes up reality. So it's not, I don't think it's far-fetched at all. And, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more about less sciencey things later on, but just to put a little pin in this for the moment, there's a whole school of thought in, I guess, what we're going to call alternative fields right now that what, what you're describing sounds very much like a concept called the akashic records that says that all consciousness is one and that everything is stored that every single one of us experiences every thought every feeling every experience that we have is stored in one like kind of giant database to be collected where we are all connected and i you know, know that was I, a very, you know, very do i call you lynn or, or certainly you know, please call me lynn yeah. Cool, cool gray is awkward. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, 
Um, I, I want to share uh, with your audience, uh, you know, what I learned about near-death experiences and what it's like to nearly die. I'd like to get right to that. But yeah. I would like to share with you that after about 30 years of studying the neuroscience of consciousness and spirituality, it's clear to me that whether you're a Tibetan monk or whether you're an alternative uh, you know, medicine practitioner, or whether you're a believer in the Akashic Records, or whether you're a modern neuroscientist, we're all saying the same thing, yet using dramatically different terminology. So it makes it only seem like we're disagreeing with each it's other. It's a, a different way of expressing the way that we can each wrap our minds around uh, exactly. the concept. And none of us, I think, has the complete picture. So in a way, I feel like all of those voices are necessary in order to arrive at anything close to objective truth, which is another kind of interesting area. The nature of consciousness is a subject of great interest to me, but the whole idea of objective truth, uh, I, I'm coming to the conclusion the longer I live that it doesn't exist, <laughs> you know? Now you've gone on to write other books that were focusing less on the on the sciencey end of things. Like it wasn't really studies anymore uh, from a from a like a laboratory perspective, but talking more about the integration of what we know about medical science and what we know about consciousness and spirituality. So can you tell me a little bit about where God lives and what we would encounter in that book? You know the the, the question is what is real. And real is what our brain creates. This conversation that we're having now, you're not actually perceiving it. What you're doing and, and I'm doing is we're hearing bits of information that uh, are in the electromagnetic field. We're sampling that information with our various bodily sensors. And then we're taking that information and we're taking it into the brain which is a sort of, you know, a little, you know, it's a it's data in, processor. Yes, yeah. You know, <laughs> and, and then uh, the sense of hearing uh, and, you know, and tones and uh, et cetera is then created. So it's it, you know, oftentimes I hear uh, people sort of casually dismiss the near death experience. They say, well, it's just a bunch of neurochemicals. Everything that we experience is neurochemicals. And I was uh, fascinated to discover that specific areas of our brain actually are there to allow us to have this experience. So, so think about it. Well, you know, why would we evolve a, a God sensing area of our brain unless for no reason? Yeah. There's gotta be a reason for that. You know, the, you know, it's just to create some sort of hallucination that can ease us into death. Well, you know, nature is not really that kind. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's more likely that, uh, that this area of the brain exists because it has a specific purpose, just like the area of the brain which allows us to move our arm, just like the area of the brain that allows us uh, to interpret um, uh, the uh, signals that then are translated into words, into conversation. We have an actual area of our brain. It's in the right temporal lobe and the hippocampus and you know deep uh, areas uh, there and which specifically allow us uh, to have this experience. Walter Penfield, who is the father of modern neurosurgery, he used to do these great experiments where he actually stimulated the area of the brain with electrodes while patients were alert and uh, awake. And he would stimulate the motor area of the brain and they moved their arm. And he would stimulate this area of the brain I'm referring to. And they would say things like, oh God, I'm leaving my body. Or even more interesting, they'd say, I'm half in and I'm half out. Wow. So that's teaching us that this experience is the human experience. That when we learn to use our brains properly uh, to, you know, one part of it is to learn how to use the spiritual area of our brain. I understand that there's enormous uh, a cultural overlay that can be very, very confusing. Uh, that, you know, if you, if you grow up in, in one area of the, of the world in one specific time period, uh, when you use your spiritual area of the brain, you're going to interpret it as uh, Muhammad or, you know, a Muslim type. Of right. Over. And then if you grow up at a different period of time uh, in a different area of the world, 
uh, you'll see it as a Christian experience or as a Hopi Indian experience, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, et cetera. And then I, I understand that then people can, you know, uh, well, wait a minute, you know, I saw this and I saw that. But that's all just the cultural interpretations. Right. Once we, you know, just like different languages. Uh, I don't think that anybody denies uh, that because I speak English and other people speak French, that language doesn't exist, that language is just some sort of invention of the mind. Uh, I think that everybody understands that there's a we have a language processor, uh, and depending on where you are culturally, you're going to uh, learn mm -hmm. a language. So the, this uh, spiritual area of the brain, um, we came up with this idea uh, in uh, the, the medical team that I work with. Uh, in uh, well, we published our book Where God Lives uh, in 2005, which has been you know over 15 years ago. Since then, the scientific community, we've gotten no pushback from the scientific community at all. In fact, the only pushback we've gotten is from a guy named Mario Beauregard at the University of Montreal uh, in Canada. And he said, no, 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 they got it all wrong. It's not a God spot. It's a God brain. And his research has shown that perhaps 30% of our brain is hardwired to allow us to perceive God, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get into the whole, you know, oh gosh, I once gave a lecture, Lynn, and I was talking about God. And then someone came up to me afterwards and they said, you, you know, your lecture was so bogus. Uh, you know, uh, I don't believe in God. I just believe in a higher power. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you, know, it's just, you know, it's just, that's why I mean, kids are so great. You know, they'll just say it was a light. It was God. They'll often just say, I don't know what it was. Right. <laughs> so, you know, like I said, you know, it's something that had a lot of good things in it. But whatever it is, we don't have to wait till we die to have this experience. That's clear. Uh, and and often many people who have spiritual experiences in, you know, in the, you know, in the 21st century in, 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 in America, you know, the, the most common preface uh, to a, a great, uh, amazing spiritual experience is you're going to think I'm crazy, but, mm -hmm. and then they'll tell you this profound experience. Well, I don't hear it that way. I hear it as the normal functioning of the spiritual aspect of my brain permitted me to have this, you know, and then whatever their right. experience is. And I think that's the difference between uh, dismissing the spiritual experiences that can transform our lives and uh, validating them and understanding that science supports them. I could see um, from my own personal journey and from what I know of people around me, you're talking about when, when you said, we don't have to wait to die to have these experiences. There seems to be uh, something in us that is always reaching for something that's beyond our earthly experience. So the uprise of organized uh, religious systems to give us something to attach to that's greater than ourselves, uh, a code to live by. There's comfort or... Um, uh, Re reassurance in that like we can't simply rely on our own moral compass always that we need to have a set of rules to live by on the other hand there was the psychedelic movement in the hippie culture but also before and more recently in the medical field to be using psychotropic psychedelics therapeutically in order to help people recover from trauma and other uh, mental health conditions that was showing great promise until I believe it was the Nixon administration and the war on drugs that that put a stop to all the research that was being done there that's only now beginning to reemerge in certain places in the world it's still largely illegal here although I believe ketamine therapy is being done in this country right now I think that's the only legal psychedelic um that can be used in a clinical environment. But the idea of altering our state of consciousness, whether it's through um, some kind of uh, religious meeting or whether it's through a psychedelic experience or people who are traveling somewhere to, to meet a shaman and have some kind of, is it ashwagandha or? Uh, ayahuasca. Ayahuasca, ashwagandha is an herbal supplement. Ayahuasca experience. The, the desire to reach outside of ourselves for something kind of esoteric as a way to improve or take us to another place or a higher place, that seems to be in 
many of us, I'm not going to say all of us, some people are very content to live their quiet little lives, you know, and not step outside of the bounds. But those of us who have those predilections, and I'm not immune to them myself, I spent 17 years deeply entrenched in the uh, Christian world, which I no longer am, but I, I can look back on it now and see that it was filling that need in me. Um, I'm fascinated by the idea of psychedelics in a in a clinical setting. I think that's a, a just a fascinating thing. Um, I think that comes from possibly, let me know what you think, the same place in the brain. It's making us want more than just it, it, this feeling that there's got to be more, I think is pervasive. And I just want to invite you to... Mm -hmm. But... If you understand spiritual neuroscience, you understand that the answers are inside of you. And when you when you look at the various religions, um, almost uh, all of the major religions have this message as well. You know, for example, in the Jewish religion in the Old Testament, uh, the prophet Jeremiah said, he said that the, one of his conversations with this God, whatever it is, said, no longer do you need to have others teach you the law. No other, no longer do you need priests, you know, but the law can be found inside of you. Sure, I, I, I can see that maybe if you're sort of adrift and you sort of have some sort of sense of something's missing, but what what's missing you can find inside of yourself. I'm very grateful to Dr. Morse for creating so much amazing content for me and for being willing to make himself available to have such an in-depth conversation about such sciencey things with a non-scientist. Honestly, that means a lot to me. These are the conversations that I want to be having. And I don't guess there are a whole lot of neurologists that would be willing to just sit down and have them with me. So Dr. Morse, you have my gratitude. Thanks so much. I've chosen a special parting thought for those of you listening into this, just because you happened upon it and you don't normally listen to the podcast. I close every episode with a parting thought. And the parting thought today is something I found on the internet. And it's just simply credited to lowercase e, lowercase h. So I don't know who that is, but I'm giving them the credit for it. And I think that it fits really well with some of the things that we were talking about in a very poetic way. So I'm going to share that with you now. It's a little poem. It's not the endings that will haunt you but the space where they should lie. The things that simply faded without one final goodbye. Like a book with torn out pages, forgetting things you're sure you knew. A question with no answer and a song stopped halfway through. So when your mind attempts to store them, their crooked shape will never fit. And forever in the corners of your consciousness, they'll sit. Jagged edges made from moments you can't quite be sure were the last slicing open thoughts that healed as you attempt to slip right past. You see, not knowing is what haunts you, the memories that never mend, for they're puzzles missing pieces of all the things that didn't. I'm going to leave you on that note. I'm going to ask you to come on over and watch the entire episode of my conversation on near-death experiences in children with Dr. Morse, if you have not already. If you're watching for the first time, I just want to encourage you to go check out the other mini-sodes as well as the other episodes on the YouTube channel, or you can go ahead and listen to the Cool Great in Studio A podcast on your favorite platform. For now, I just want to say thanks for listening. Come on back. I will see you next time. Cool Gray in Studio A is a fine-tuned services production. It exists for entertainment purposes and is not intended to be used as a sole source of information or advice on any subject. Find and follow this podcast at coolgraystudios.com.